Once again, our sermon is based on the gospel that can be found on page 6 of your service folder if you'd like to follow along. Isaiah 43. <clears throat> but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Those who have been summoned, those who have been called and chosen and redeemed, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Question to begin your day with today. What are you worth? Might still be thawing out from the frost. Might still be trying to get some finger back, some feeling back in your fingers. You might be saying to yourself, geez, Pastor, that is quite a deep question for me to ponder, but I want you to think about it today. Because whether you realize it or not, you've been thinking that question every day of your life, whether consciously or subconsciously, going back to the day that you were born. What am I worth? What is my value? I mean, think about it. The aging adolescent that is asking a million questions a day, and that's not an overstatement. Millions of questions a day is a child asking. This might be at the forefront of what they ask. What am I worth? What is my value? As they assess the actions and reactions of their classmates and fellow students out on the playground, out during recess, in the cafeteria, in the classroom, they don't feel like all that much when they're chosen last for kickball or four square or for the game of dodgeball, right? But it doesn't stop in the early ages. It goes throughout all of our lives at whatever level you're in. What am I worth? What's my value? That's what the middle-aged adult is asking is they're trying to do that juggling act, that impossible balancing act of their vocations. There's not enough time in the day, there's not enough abilities on my own to fulfill them all perfectly for the ability that I want to. So you give a little here and you, you take a little there, and at the end of the day, how do you feel? Well, I might feel valued and worthy when it comes to this vocation and this person, but I feel absolutely worthless and of no benefit at all in this avenue. Or you think about later on in life, the wiser, the more learned of adults and individuals that's heading into their stages of retirement. They're setting behind their trade, they're setting beside, behind their occupation and their job that they have done, some of them, for decades. And there's that question. If I'm not going to use my hands, if I'm not going to use my head, if I'm not going to use my abilities in my career, of what value am I at all to this world? It's a question that we all ask, whether we realize it or not. It's an important question that demands an answer. An amount is attached to everything in this world, right? Everything has value. So it's a question that we need to ask ourselves. And it's a question that in all reality many people offer up. The many people that experience life with us, whether they realize it or not, have a value attached to us, have a worth attached to us. What we can give to them, what we can provide for them, what we do and benefit for them. I mean, ask your boss. Do you have value to them? Absolutely. At the end of the day, they have to attach a dollar amount, whether it's to the annual salary or to your hourly rate. And what's that based on? Well, what you can produce. What you can benefit either the consumer or the employee or both. What you can produce. What you can bring to the table and offer that other people can or can't. You have value to your boss. Maybe you were a little bit surprised, maybe a little bit underwhelmed this Christmas as someone attached value to you as they gave you a present. Do you unwrap that box of chocolates that still unfortunately had the clearance tag on it and was expired by a couple of days? You thought to yourself, really? This is all I'm valued to and all it worth to you? Maybe it was your spouse or friend. But then you open that present from your second cousin that you rarely see anymore and it's a collector's watch and you're astonished because they have that value to you. How do you answer that question on your own? What am I worth? Well, if you're like me, it seems like you're on one pole or the other. On some days, I feel like the greatest thing since sliced bread. I have the heart of the Pharisee that thinks of myself more than I am, right? What a benefit other people are to be around me, how blessed they would be. And then on the next day, I feel like a piece of trash. I should be thrown out into the dumpster. The reality is that there is feedback from every front. It surrounds us in every way. And whether you want to admit it or not, our perceived value affect our, affects our lives. On some days, when people don't give us all that much value, we feel empty, overcome, overwhelmed. We feel like nothing and nobody's. And on other days, 
when they tell us and remind us how great they think that we are, we feel like the greatest thing ever. So which one is it? People have opinions about our value all around us. Which ones do we value? Well, the reality is this. At the end of the day, every opinion that I just talked about really means nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now, now, don't get me wrong. God in his word has made it very clear that he does want us to have a good rapport and respect with our peers and with our acquaintances, with our friends and our family members and those around us. That's an important thing. But their opinions don't matter. God's not going to call up my boss when it comes to my ticket to eternal salvation and weigh in on what he thinks of me, whether it's good or bad. He's not going to call up your second cousin when it comes to how he treats and how he acts towards you based on your second cousin's life. And although you might hear that voice in your head most, although that might be the opinion that overwhelms you day after day, even your opinion of yourself does not matter. There's only one opinion that does. It's the one that created you. If you want to know what something is worth, go to the source. Think about it. Value is subjective. It really is. Value is what someone is worth paying for or giving up to have that object in return. So as we open up God's word, we are astonished and amazed at what our God would be willing to give up to have us back. The effort, the pain, what he would be willing to endure to make us out his once more. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to cancel and quiet every other opinion out there, even our own. And instead, listen to the one that handcrafted and knit us together in that secret place. That fearfully and wonderfully created us. We're going to listen to what he says about us. And the value and the worth that he attaches to you and to me every single day. That's what we're going to do as we open up to the, the gospel according to St. Mark. That's exactly what he's going to do for us. He's going to point us to the value that we have. And you're going to notice something. When he answers that question for you, what are you worth? He's not going to point you to your 2023 sales report. He's not going to talk to you about how well or how poor you have done in the stock market. He's not going to point you to your likes or dislikes on social media. He's not even going to point you to you. He's going to take eyes, your eyes off everything else. And he is going to point you to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And at the end of the day, we're left declaring one thing. Worthy is the Lamb, and by God's grace, worthy am I. It's astonishing. It's amazing, right? It's kind of confusing when you open up the Gospel of Mark for the first time. There isn't, but it seems like there's a couple of chapters missing, or at least a couple of years, right? There's no genealogies. There's no young life of Jesus. Instead, Jesus' story begins with whom? John's story. It begins with John the Baptist. As we open up our verses for today, we hear about a man that many people would say had a worthless life, whose ministry meant absolutely nothing, right? His life that began at leaping in the womb, in his mother's womb, at Jesus' presence, and ended with what? His head on a silver platter. Many people would say that his life had no meaning at all, but I'm here today to remind you, and so is Mark, that every minute of his life had tremendous value had worth, had riches beyond anything this world could ever imagine. And you might be saying to yourself, and that'd be a valid reaction to have, how? What are we told about John in our verses? John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. Where's the riches there? I mean, think about it. It wouldn't be found in his abhorrent and disgusting attire. You wouldn't even find that for sale at the local Red Racks camel's hair and a leather belt. There was really no value or cost at all in his diet, right? What did he eat? Well, the wild locusts that were buzzing his tower, he ate the honey right off the honeycomb. What about the place that he had his ministry? He wasn't preaching and teaching in Solomon's temple, adorned with silver and gold. He was out in the barren wilderness wasteland. So, Pastor, what are you and Mark talking about when you say his life, his ministry, had meaning, deep, and severe value and riches? Where was it? It was in his message, right? 
Not in the location or the attire or the place. Not in what he ate or what he did. But what he said. What he shared with the people. It was worth all the wealth and the riches in this world. When those people left the marketplace and when they left the towns and villages to come out into the wilderness, they did so for a reason. Because John was offering something, them something that nobody else was. And what was that? He was encouraging them to come before the Lord completely open. Admitting and owning up to every single one of their sins. Making claim for them, acknowledging them, and saying that that is mine. And laying them at the feet of their God. And being amazed when he does not punish you for it, but instead he's punished in your place. Instead he takes credit and blame for it on himself. And what does he do in return? He forgives you. He does away with those sins. And he remembers them no more. That is the only reason that people were leaving the towns and coming out into the wilderness to hear what John had to say. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. With more than anything else was what John was sharing. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. There's a reason there were people lining up on that bank of the Jordan River. Because John was offering them something no one else was. It was the answer. Remember that John began his ministry and his message with this. Jesus Christ is coming back. The Son of God in the flesh is going to be revealed, and you're going to have to stand before him one-on-one -on -one and answer for the things that you've done in the body, whether good or bad. You're going to have to take a look at the list of his commandments, every single one of them, and answer for every single time that you've broken them. So what are you going to say? And those people, by faith, moved by the Holy Spirit, when they were honest with themselves, said... I have no answer. I have nothing to offer him. I have nothing to pay or buy, bribe or borrow from him. All I can give him is an empty set of hands that is pleading for mercy. It's the same thing that you have. It's the same thing that I have. There's a reason that if I were alive at the time of John the Baptist, I too would have been in line that day. I too would have waited however long it took, whether it was hours or days, waiting to be baptized by John and receive that message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Why? Because I'm just as worthless and empty of amazing acts as those sinners that lined up that day. Because if you took all the greatest accomplishments that I have ever done, the, the most wonderful highlight reel of things that I have done in my life and stockpiled and stacked them up, you know what you would see. A pile of filthy, sin-riddled rags. And if there is a way for you to gather and to collect every single sin that I have committed in my life, there isn't a store, there isn't a warehouse, there isn't a bank big enough to collect them all and to hold them all in. The reality is this, on my own, I don't have the answer for the things that I've done. When it comes to my salvation, buy it, purchase it, win it? With what? I have nothing to give God on my own. I've done nothing but sin. So what can I do? The same thing that you do. And the same thing those sinners did that day. Come before God with an empty hand and beg for mercy. But what does he give you? A reminder for us every single day, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when you and I had no value at all, Jesus valued us to the greatest degree. We are not worthy of his love. We never will be. And yet he gives it to us anyways. That's the Savior that we have. Not a God that wants to hoard his riches, but a God that would do anything to make his riches ours every single day. It's the kind of savior that we have in Jesus. John the Baptist was a great pastor and a great preacher because he shared his message, his sermon first with himself. 
he realized that the sins that he was talking about and exposing in others, he himself was doing. Think about what he said. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie. John realized that because of the things that he had done, he wasn't worthy to do the lowliest of servants' tasks, to get down on his hands and knees and even touch or untie Jesus' sandals and feet. Think about how comical it was that day when Jesus showed up in the flesh. The very one that John the Baptist was preaching about, was telling others about, was speaking so highly of, was saying he's coming soon. And all of a sudden, Jesus is there before him and says, No, John, I'm here now. And I need to be baptized by you. You think of what was going through John the Baptist. Had, what are you talking about, Jesus? And we hear it in other Gospels, right? You don't need to be baptized by me. I need to be baptized by you. Why are you here? So why was Jesus there? The reality is this. It wasn't so much that Jesus needed to be baptized. But it was that we needed Jesus to be baptized. Because Jesus wasn't baptized for the same reason that you and I are baptized for. Why are we baptized? For the forgiveness of sins? Jesus, in thought, word, and action, completely pure and innocent in every way, never committed a sin of no deceit or any kind of lies whatsoever. Sin free. For the creation and the strengthening of his faith, Jesus is the object of our faith. For eternal life, Jesus is life eternal itself, the alpha and the, be and the omega, the beginning and the end. Before Abraham was, he is. So why on earth was Jesus baptized? Because you and I needed him to be. It brings us back to the ancient of days when a king had oil poured over their head or anointed for a specific task and purpose. Many of the times it was for them to rule. Why was Jesus anointed with water that day? To send a message. To send a statement that was very clear. His time has come. His time has come for him to do what his name is. Jesus, Yeshua, which means he saves. The time has come for him to destroy the devil's work, for him to march to Jerusalem and be the source of salvation for all people. He's anointed at this earthly inauguration to make a statement to all of the powers of darkness and every single one of our enemies. Jesus is here. And he's here to stay, to save that's exactly what he does in and through things like baptism, in and through the sharing and the proclamation of the word, in and through the Lord's Supper. It's a great reminder for us every day, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. I hope and I pray that you never think of the Lord's Supper and baptism as these rites and rituals that the church just does. They've always been around. It's traditions that we practice. No! You've heard me say it before in sermons and Bible studies. If a pastor preaches and teaches the Lord's Supper correctly, then his people should be banging down the door to get it and receive it. Other pastors and theologians have said the same thing. And similar can be said of your baptism. If you understand what water and the word did for you that day, you should have eternal comforts and promises to rely on and to deliver you to glory everlasting. Think about it this way. What does a child mean to their parents? What is the word that we would associate a parent when it comes to their own children? Moms and dads in the crowd, you can answer that rhetorical <coughs> question for me. There is no dollar amounts I can place on them. They're worth everything, right? They're with every dirty diaper. They're with every singed nose hair from the stench. They're with every medical and hospital bill. They're with every dollar I spent on groceries. They're with every sleepless night. They're with every ounce of effort. They're with everything that I did for them, and I'm still doing for them. Because they're my children. <coughs> what is a child of God worth to Jesus? Actually, everything. It's not an overstatement. It's not hyperbole. Jesus would do whatever it took to have his children back. 
The reality is that a child of God was worth every single whip that went into his back, was worth the infinite eternities of hell that he endured, was worth the hours of agony on that cross, was worth every pit, piece, and part of mocking and ridicule that he faced so that you could be his once more. And that's what baptism does for you. The riches that are at Christ's disposal because of your baptism are now yours. Because you have been baptized, you are adopted back into the body of believers. Because you have been baptized, your name is written in the book of life. Because you have been baptized, your sins are done away with and gone. You've been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. Because you've been baptized, you've been atoned, you've been redeemed, you've been ransomed. You are His, and He is yours. That's value right there. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there's a reason. We just sang it before this, right? There's a reason that we say not, I was baptized, as if it's this long lost event that kind of was a cool thing in the past. But no, we instead say, I am baptized. I am a baptized, blood-bought child of God. And that means something, not just in the past, but also today. So every day, I want you to remember your baptism and what that means. In the deepest, darkest pits of depression, where there seems to be no joy or hope at all, when you feel lost, when you feel hopeless, when you feel helpless, when you feel alone, when you fall and when you stumble into the same old sin, when you fall short of the glory of God, when you say yes to the devil's temptation once more, remember your baptism and what that means. That means that what Christ did, he did for you. That means that Christ's victory is yours. That means that the declaration that God made of his one and only son, he makes of you today. Because his righteousness is your righteousness. His perfection and holiness are credited to you. That's the kind of God that we have, a God that shares his wealth, that gives it openly and freely, so that at the end of every single day, when the Heavenly Father looks at you, the declaration he made of his son is yours. You are his son, or you are his daughter, whom he loves deeply and dearly. And with you, he is well pleased. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the reality is this. Those voices, those opinions that don't value all that much, they're not going anywhere. They're going to be everywhere, and they're going to be in our own head day after day. Every single day, the devil is going to lie to you and say that you have no worth, that you have no value, that no one could ever love you, that you are trash that should be thrown away. What answer should you offer to him? Where can you go? My encouragement to you today is this, flee. When the devil wants to convince you that you have no value, that you have no worth, that you are absolute and utter total trash, flee to that blood-soaked cross where the curse of sin is done away with. Flee to that empty tomb where you were emptied of your sin and the blame and the punishment and the credit for it. Flee to the crown of thorns that were pounded into his skull so that he could win for you a crown of glory. The devil's going to lie to you every day and say you have no worth, that you have no value, that you're a nothing and a nobody. But tell him every day, Jesus says otherwise. Because the reality is this, Worthy is the Lamb, and by God's grace, worthy are you. Amen.